I began this study this morning with a question. And actually, Brother Jeff, I owe you, Jeff Barnett, an appreciation for what you brought here a few weeks ago on Wednesday night concerning fear as far as this sermon is concerned. I think I told you that at times I'm listening to the men bring their talks on Wednesday evening that they're used by me not only to review my own life in the light of the message presented, but to think about, and they are good thought stimulators, for other things. And so when Jeff delivered that sermon he did on Wednesday night concerning fear, then a number of thoughts came to my mind. And so I posed the question this morning, uh, what kind of fear of God do we have? What kind of fear of God do we have? You'll remember that in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13, which is bringing that book to a close, that we learn a very important point. Fear God. And keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Well, whatever that fear is, it leads to complying with the will of heaven. It leads to keeping his commandments. And by implication, it means you've got to study the Bible to learn the will of heaven, to learn those commandments, to learn what it is to keep them. But I also read in... Uh, the 23rd Psalm, and we're surely familiar with that. This marvelous Psalm that shows such confidence and trust in God. That David says, the Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. There's a reason for that, and he tells us. For thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now notice that Ecclesiastes 12.13 declares that there is a fear of God that leads to our performance of our duty, which is keeping the commandments of God. Here David says, because of his faith, his trust, his confidence in God, and since faith comes by hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17, then that confidence in God, that trust, that faith, that love of God in David and every other servant of God, we may say, caused him not to fear what he calls evil. And of course, anything evil wouldn't be having to do with God or our service to God. So this fear of God that leads to keeping his commandments, which is our whole duty on earth, whatever it is, will help us in our confidence, trust, faith, belief in God, to not fear what is contrary to God, which is called by the Bible evil in this particular context. Now, when you get down further to this study, you will see that there are at least two types, specific types of fear in the Bible. The first type is beneficial and to be encouraged. The second type, is a detriment to the Christian. And it's to be overcome. Takes our willpower and all of it. 
our willpower, first of all, to study the Bible, to learn the use of the word fear, and then, of course, to see the two types of fear and to reject the one that is hurtful to us and embrace the other that helps us. The first type of fear is the fear of the Lord. Go back in your concordance, just in your Bible that has one, but then get a full concordance sometime, and just notice the use of the word fear, and especially the fear of the Lord. What is this fear? Well, when you read in the Bible of godly people approaching God, however he appeared to them, such as Moses at the burning bush, the bush that wasn't consumed when God out of that bush spoke and called him to do the things the Bible says Moses did in delivering the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage and all things connected with that. You will see that God expected of him a reverential awe, and that's the good fear, that he is God, and then Moses, therefore, when he turned to go see why that bush was burning without being consumed, as he approached it, he was told by the voice out of the burning bush, you put your shoes off your feet, for the ground that you're standing on is holy ground. There was a display in his bodily presentation that God said will show your reverence for the great I am. He who was and is and ever shall be God Almighty. No beginning, no ending. And he would say then when Moses said, whom shall I say has sent me? He said, tell him I am. Because there is no beginning or ending. So it's this reverence, this reverential awe toward God because of His power, His glory, His majesty. And that's what we need to be having and nobody can have that correctly if they don't learn the truth of God's Word. So I think you begin to see that Ecclesiastes 12, 13 is talking about men must come to a state of this reverential awe of God. They must be brought to that. It also, this reverential awe of God, of His power, glory, majesty, honor, and might, and eternality, that He's without beginning or ending, that inhabits all of the universe, that all things are made by Him, means a proper respect for this great being who is the only one of which there is no greater. Proper respect for he who is judge of all the earth, as Abraham called him. For even his wrath and for his anger, which are presented to us so we can understand that about him. You know, if I consider Jesus... I've got to consider the full way the Bible reveals him. The late Thomas B. Warren, so many years ago, wrote a book, uh, The Lamb, who is a lion. Well, why did he do that? Because when you read the scripture about Jesus, he's called the Lamb of God. But he's also called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Same being. Same being. Well, the Lamb meant the meekness and the lowliness, the willingness to do his Father's will Read Isaiah 53. As a lamb brought before his slaughter is dumb, so open he not his mouth. That is, he resigned himself to humble himself. And no matter how painful and terrible the sacrifice would be as far as what came upon him, he was willing to do it to save us. But he pictures himself in coming back to the earth not to set foot on it, but to judge it. Once he leaves it, you'll never find, as he has, him standing, setting foot on this earth again. But uh, Paul says to Christians who are persecuted for their faith in Christ, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven, in mighty power, flames and fire, that description is not like a, a lamb walking down a little path 
in a meadow. Flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Then he says, but it'll be right the opposite with the saved when he comes. With the children of God, the Christians, the members of the body of Christ, the faithful. When he comes to be magnified, if you please. To be enjoyed, adored, upheld for who they learned him to be in their faithful service of the gospel. That shows they had developed this reverential awe in recognition that he is what he is. The fear of the Lord is the total acknowledgement of all that deity is. Which only comes through a proper scriptural knowledge of him. If you look to Psalm 111 and verse 10. Uh, you'll see. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. His praise endureth forever. Does that hearken back to what our whole duty is? To fear God and keep his commandments. Then you'll notice from Proverbs 1, 7 that he says only fools despise wisdom and discipline. While we study the Bible to be disciplined, the discipline is something that guides us and leads us and keeps us on a given path. In Proverbs 14, 27, it's called the fountain of life. And then preceding verse 27, it provides security and a place of safety for us. And yet it all comes because this reverential awe this full acknowledgement of God that he is God. It's the beginning of all of that. This fear of God. Now, the second type of fear mentioned in the Bible is a detriment to anybody wanting to serve God that loves him. And it's of no benefit to Christians. It is the spirit of a fear that's mentioned by Paul to the young preacher Timothy in 2 Timothy 1 7. Notice what he said here. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love. Now, watch this last part, and the implications of it could help psychiatrists and psychologists all over this world and of a sound mind. You want a sound mind? Learn to fear God. It's the beginning of wisdom. You keep his commandments. His commandments guide you as to what to think on. What you're to do and not to do. How to be pleasing to him. This is an overworked phrase. You get your priorities right. <laughs> so. A spirit of fear, a disposition of fear, an attitude of fear as he uses the word here. And he says timidity does not come from God. It's the lack of boldness to stand up for the truth even when you know you're going to suffer for it. It's a, it's a fading backward when push comes to shove and you now have to stand up for the truth. But you withdraw. You don't say what you ought to say or do what you ought to do. or You say, let somebody else do it. I'm behind you, way behind you. It's that kind of thing. Now, this was needful in those days. It's always needful. We would understand the importance of it more today if the church was literally being dealt with by unbelievers as it was in much of the first century and for a long time thereafter. I want us to take note of what reverential awe, good fear toward God will do for you and for me. I think we've said enough to know what the bad fear is. It's just simply not to have enough love of God to do what he said. 
not to have enough reverential awe of God and all that He is to obey His commandments. It's the fear of God that will not lead you to obey Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13. And it will lead you into a fear of evil which David said we shouldn't fear evil. That is that which is contrary to God and the will of God. That which is a source of the devil. So we need the good fear. We need the reverence for his power and glory. Even his wrath and anger. Even the total acknowledgement of all that God is. And it comes through a proper stu study of the scriptures. The psalmist declared, Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. Psalm 56 and verse 3. Have you ever been afraid? Just knee-knocking afraid. <laughs> well... I don't think I've ever been afraid to the extent that some would have been if literally you knew people were coming to arrest you because you were a Christian and to do not tell them what with you. But there's been a few times when I've had to swallow a lump in my throat and say, this is right, so I'm going to do it no matter what. And I don't know how a person lives the Christian life at times and not have those given situations. Whenever I'm afraid, what do I do? What's my first inclination? Where do I turn to overcome this fear, the kind of fear that is a fear of evil for what it will do to me, and thus I'm prone or tempted not to stand when I ought to stand, speak out when I ought to speak, do what needs to be done, do it in the way it needs to be done, and at the proper time. Uh, what do I do about that? Well, he said, I, I'll trust in God. That's a learned thing. That doesn't just happen with a snap of the finger. He is telling you what he's learned to do to overcome fear. Well, if he learned that, can't we? Can't we learn the same thing? In verse 11, and maybe this will tell you where something came from that's been around in our country a long time. In God have I put my trust well, what's the impact of that? I will not be afraid what man can do unto me. I stand amazed over 45 years of preaching. How many in the church can boldly declare things, but when push comes to shove, when it comes right down to having to stand, you can't find them. It's easy to stand up and say, here's what the Bible says. You can read, can't you? You believe that's the Bible, don't you? God's Word, isn't it? Tells us how to live, doesn't it? Everybody says, yes, 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 yes. Well, here's what he said. And we're all gung ho. But when somebody's after you <laughs> and going to do you some kind of dirt because you love the Lord and keep His commandments, in other words, you fear Him, that reverential awe more than you do anything else, then what? Well, notice what the psalmist said. In God, I did something personally that involved my own specific decision. A purposed act on my part. I put my trust in God. Well, doing that, I will. Look at that. I will. I have will myself. There's where a lot of folks fall down in religion all over the place today. They think it's God's will, so I don't have to do anything. But he said, I, I have willed not to be afraid what man can do unto me. The most pitiful sight on this earth are those who wear the name Christian, which as you know means of Christ, who with the mouth make all sorts of confessions, right confessions, true to the book. But then when it gets to the pinch time, they really show they don't have much confidence and trust in God to take care of them in the first place. They're just about like the rest of the world. Isaiah 41 and verse 10 should give us a lot of encouragement. List what the great prophet said. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, 
I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness unless the dollar goes pooey and the United States government falls flat. And you're on your own then. We should go back and look at the times a great many of the people the Bible records as faithful, the times, I say, in which they lived. A lot of those folks were in dire straits all the time. And yet God picked them like Isaiah to comfort us who've had very little of anything to deal with in the way that they did in opposition to God. Jesus plainly told us through the people of his day, notice this plain, explicit prohibition. Now remember back over in the garden, one prohibition tested their faith in God. Don't eat of the fruit in the midst of the garden, of that tree that's in the midst of the garden. Don't do it. Do not do it. Now listen to this. Jesus said, do not fear those who kill the body and cannot kill the soul. Lay the commandments alongside. What's the difference in disobeying one and disobeying the other? There's none. It's he says, now listen, I'll tell you whom you shall fear. Who's the one who's able to destroy both soul and body in hell, Matthew 10, 28. Most of the time we got it right backwards. We don't really fear God at all. Oh yeah, but I do. Well, we do thinking we should, knowing we should, knowing it's God's will, and saying what the Bible says. But Jesus said, by their fruits you shall know them. John reminds us, right new Christians had so much said about this as he did love. He says, there is no fear in love. Well, it can't be the fear he talks about in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. For he said, fear God and keep his commandments for this whole duty of man. But, but he says here, John does, the apostle of love, he says very plainly, there's no fear in love. Well, fear of what? Fear of what men shall do unto me that David talked about, evil. Fear of God even condemning you to torment because you love him and are obedient to him. If you're like those that Jesus said, be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life. Surely these folks did not have a fear of this world, of the things of it, and the people of it, the enemies of God, that would lead them to violate God's will. It's right the opposite. Their faith in God and their love of God because of their great respect for their God himself, their reverential fear, led them to be obedient, even unto death. That means I'm faithful to what I believe in my actions, even if it will cause me to die, then that's the way it's going to be. And Christ says, you do that, and to heaven you will go. That's not what he says. You tell me you have to write say it. And what he's telling us we must believe and do in order to receive it. There's no fear in love. Well, now think about this. Jesus said in John 14, 15, If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. That's why there's no fear in love. Well, what's the whole duty of man? Fear God and what? Keep his commandments. But there's no fear in love. But love leads you to obey his commandments. So it must be that that reverential fear, fear is coupled with the love of God because it leads you to obey His commandments. But the whole duty of man to do is to obey His commandments. You see the connection, brethren? There's no fear in love, but perfect love. Perfect. You mean I've got to be flawless in my love? doesn't say that. Perfect here means be complete in your love. How do you make love complete? Do what God said do and the way God said do it. And for the reason, if there's more than one reason that he gives for doing it, then that. Perfect love does what? Cast out fear. Show me a person who fears what men will do to him, and I'll show you a person whose faith's weak, whose love of God is not anywhere near what it ought to be. Because perfect love, complete love, and obedient love, fear God, keep his commandments, this whole duty of man, cast out fear. Have you ever cast anything out? <laughs> you ever cast anything out? Just threw it out. 
Well, how can you have then this complete love, which is the love that obeys, takes God at his word in every case? How can you have that and fear remain? You, you can't do it. Now, notice what he says. This is that bad fear again. This is the fear that ought to be cast out and will be cast out when we have the love that's talked about here. He says, because fear involves torment. Brethren, there are a lot of folks who wear the name of Christ that are tormented. They're tormented by everything under the sun. A lot of it's right upstairs in their mind. You won't see it in their face because they learn it. Well, you might see it in their face sometimes. But you won't hear it in their voice as to what they say because, frankly, they cover up a whole lot. And the turmoil is going on right here. If, if, if there's some way you could project what's going on up here that they've learned to mask over here, it would look worse than a, a, a nest of mad hornets with all, but they mask it. There's no really any peace of heart. They're trembling at everything David said, I won't fear no evil. They do. <laughs> They've learned to give you the right, the right answers. Do you love God? Yes. Where does it teach that? John 14, 15. But when it comes to, well, we say, you know, when push comes to shove, it's another story. 1 John 4, 18 is where that says that we read it. In other words, there's, there's really nothing in this life which a child of God needs to fear in the bad fear that we're talking about. Not a thing. And the child of God develops through his knowledge and practice of the truth the reverential awe of God. Remember what Thomas said when he recognized the nail prints in the risen Lord's hand? And he had already said when they reported to him the Lord's risen, well, unless I can see the evidence, I'm not going to believe. Well, he appears to him. Jesus knows what was on his mind, knew what he said when he said it. And he said, you thrust your hand in my scars. And be not faithless, but believe him. You know what he did? And this is reverential all. The exclamation of Thomas was, my Lord and my God. Now that's what God wants to see formed in every one of us. And that's the reverential fear. that takes God for what he is, and he's the only one that's like that. God Almighty. He who was and is and ever shall be. Jehovah God. That's the fear we've got to have or we won't go to heaven. It's the fear that in living the Christian life is cultivated and developed. It's, it's not a fear that makes us, as Jeff well pointed out, uh, just simply look at God as some ogre looking for the opportunity to bite our heads off. It's not that. It's wrong view. Although the Christian knows these things to be true, if he believes the Bible studies it and understands it, we still know we're human beings and subject to all the frailties that go along with being human. And so we still have our natural human emotion to various sundry situations when we're threatened with danger. When economic conditions point to a possible job loss. And some people can handle all that, but what really happens is, is they realize that they can get sick with an incurable sickness when we're stricken with a serious illness. Now, sometimes it's with other problems when they arise, whatever they might be, but they're usually problems that really disrupt our normal lives, whatever a normal life on earth is. Sometimes we'd do well to wonder why we use some of those terms. <laughs> and we're likely then to become afraid. Well, let me ask this. Does God give us the wherewithal to overcome those things? What makes us most fearful about our all such uh, circumstances, situations, is that we simply do not know what the future holds. I watch people every day trying to prepare for the future and missing the main thing in preparing for the future. What does the Bible tell you about where it's all headed? Ultimately, and finally, everything that is physical and material that pertains to time, the appetites of the flesh, and all the concerns of this life, where is it all headed? To be burned up, be gone completely. And yet most people are anxious about tomorrow, not 
am I saved from my sins and ready to meet my God? But a place to live and money to spend and food to eat and medicine to heal us. Well, see if any of that works when the Lord comes back a second time. What we want is forgiveness of sins, reconciliation to God, justified in His sight, the expectation of heaven when there's no place like material a material place to be. And the Bible over and over again talks about your long home. Everything, even in typology, as we said last week, when the children of Israel are going through the wilderness wandering, and there's the land of Canaan, land flowing with milk and honey, land of promise. Now, what is it a type of? Heaven. New heaven and new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. As long as things are going reasonably well, whatever that really means, I've always tried to figure out just exactly what that means, we usually assume that they will continue to do so and, and thus we're not fearful. But when difficulties cause us more to look to tomorrow, next week, a month, next year, and it's hitting this whole nation right now, when we don't know what will happen, and now they have the reality shows coming up of folks building bunkers and everything else on the sun. And you know why? We're afraid. <laughs> We're downright afraid of what will happen to us in this life if the way we're living now is snatched away from us. We're afraid. Now, is it the fear that the Bible says good for you that will lead you to heaven? No. Do you realize in taking that perspective, you go read the Sermon on the Mount and you tell me what the Lord's trying to tell those people. He's telling us not to do what a great many of us are, are doing. It's certainly true that you don't know what will happen on tomorrow. James said that. Don't know. He asked, what is your life? Trying to make us understand it's more than material things. Then he says it's, it's, it's very... Very brief, it's like a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away, James 4.14. When people become frightened, you know what we tend to do? We run away. Have you ever read how in the wars, the battles, the green troops, if they could ever get frightened, it looks like that the whole thing's coming down on them, people dying all around them and the army's coming at them. You can't, unless somebody was ever in war like that, there's no way we could appreciate it. And then what happens? Well, the army breaks, fear that was there gets bigger, you see everybody else running, what do you do? You run. That's why Paul said, quit you like men. Stand fast. Those are military terms. Over my 47 years, whatever it is of preaching, one of the things that has, I don't know, I don't have words to describe how it's affected me. But I've watched brethren have problems come up in their life. They didn't anticipate them. They probably thought it would never happen to them. But it really shook them up. And I've watched many of them start running. I know of a situation where a fellow got a little upset and put out and whatever and, and begin to try to find him and he was just going down the highway 50 miles away from where he started and when I asked what he was doing he said I was just driving just going well where were you I don't know I just got wrong going just getting away get away from what what is at least there ought to be some place you know you're going but people do that folks listen we don't like reality and when that old reality of the doctor saying, you got cancer. When that old reality comes up and says, you got some sort of physical problem. Well, how many sermons have you heard that you've got to die, folks? And that means some part of this body's got to quit. Or somebody's going to run over you or something either way. <laughs> you get mashed or whatever, you're going to die. But we don't think that way. And we think problems are all belongs to bread. They can have all the problems. I'll be here to comfort them. 
Never think somebody's got. Would you, do you think you need comforting? And so we run. And we may not really run by going getting that car and taking off somewhere where we don't know, but we're running. Well, we start running up here. It may be because it's this fear of having to face what we thought we never would have to. And you know what we begin to find out? My love for Christ is really not all I thought it was. And my faith in God and His Word as to how you live the Christian life and going through thick and thin, lo and behold, I never knew it could be this way. And then mental problems start, and then emotional problems start. All because of lack of love of God, and we're taught to love Him with all that we are and love our neighbors ourselves. We're not prepared. We run away. Whatever frightens us, we like to run away. You want to see how easy it is that's built in us? Get a little kid, about like two grandkids here, some small ones. Get them over. I, I could do it right now. Get them back here in one of these rooms that's dark. Just let them go back there. Come on, show you something. Shut the door. It's real dark. And go, <laughs> and watch them. I, some of you'd be that way. When people become frightened, they run. They either do it literally or mentally. They don't care for a reality for which they are unprepared. And oftentimes, it's because they're ashamed or they're embarrassed of something, and they react the same way. And they try to run away from whatever caused them to become embarrassed, ashamed, or afraid. Afraid. You don't think it can happen to some uh, pretty potent fellows in faith and love of God? You ever hear of Elijah? Seems to me he ran off and hid in the cave. He said, they're all dead but me. And God had to sell. There's 7,000 that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. Folks, we're all in the same boat together. It's just a matter of when it hits us one way or the other and how we react to it. And we react to it on the basis of our faith in God and our love of God. And how am I going to know that my faith is not what really it ought to be and my love of God's not as fervent as I thought it was until the test comes? So why do people react in this way? Their fervent love for God or their strong faith in God? No. Right, the opposite. They, they simply don't have what they thought they had. They have a weak love and a weak faith, and they're still trying to find sustenance in this present world, and they want to run away from the problems. I don't like it. It hurts. It doesn't feel good. Have you ever seen people go out for football or go out for something, and more? they just go, but when they have to hit that August heat twice a day, some reason or another, they don't like it like they used to. Well, that's reality, and people don't like reality. Remember Peter? We're like Peter. Or they all leave you, I won't. Now what happened? He didn't just not stand up for the Lord. He swore and said, I don't know him. Don't know who he is. It wasn't long before that. He was saying it. Well, do you think that made Peter stronger when he came to him senses? And the Bible says the Lord looked at him. He went out and wept bitterly. He's a different man because of what he went through. The psalmist knew that times would arise when he would be afraid. His determination was that in such times he would trust in the Lord, which is on the basis of his word. He went ahead to say, in God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear. What can flesh do to me? The Hebrews writer quotes this statement to remind every member of the Lord's church that we need to trust God whenever we're afraid. Interesting that we can see the value of the Old Testament so clearly when we look at how the Holy Spirit who revealed it in the Old Testament brings it over and has a New Testament writer use it in the last will and testament of Jesus Christ for our good. Listen. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. Let your conduct, your manner of life, be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. 
So we may boldly say, not just say, but boldly say, the Lord is my helper. helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? We need this, brethren, in any time, but when we've been so used to nice things and sweet things and whatever, and that's our reality, and then when those things begin to turn around and whatever, and something comes from where we didn't think it would come, well, there's one who never changes. There's one who's always there. His words always meaning what it means. And when all this life falls apart, God's there. He gave His Son to die for you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Jesus is still saying, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. But there's something we have to do. We have to follow His way, doing things His way. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart. And ye shall find rest unto your souls. Don't be like Jonah when the command of God comes. He doesn't like it. And then try to run away from God. Run to God. When all the problems of life come upon you, run to God. Run to His Word. Read the psalmist's words. And you too will be saying, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. You need to obey the gospel. You need to run to Jesus in humility and believing and obeying the truth, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Him and being baptized for the remission of your sin. To live faithful to Him the rest of your life. But if, as a child of God, you sin, there is a second law of pardon. Jesus, the great advocate, has said plainly, if you sin, you confess your sins. We're to, of course, in repenting of them, confess them, and then pray God for forgiveness. Now's the time to do that. Let the words of God move you to think as you ought to think. And draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you. And he's still standing with outstretched, nail-scarred hands, bidding you to come unto him. All you that labor and are heavy laden with the reverential awe of God Almighty, that you will not fear the evil that men will do unto you, but you'll know your Heavenly Father loves you and has given his Son to make up all the difference. And someday heaven will be our home in the great by and by. If you're subject to this great call, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.